We're going to start uh, with the first section, which is about the history, struggles, and contributions of each of our communities. In this section, uh, both David Wu and Otis Moss III will be sharing, but the question that I would like each of you to answer, and if we have time for the other panelists to chime in at the end, you may, is could you share some of the histories, the struggles, and the contributions that your communities have experienced? Yeah, thank you, Ray, uh, for introducing me and uh, giving me a chance to speak before the Reverend Moss who is more passionate and more eloquent than I. You know, um, Asian Americans are often lumped together, Koreans, Japanese, South, South Asians, others. Uh, but today, tonight, I'm just going to tell you the story about, about Chinatown, because that's what I know. Uh, Chinese first came to this country uh, to mine in the, in the gold rush and to build, build the railroads. And uh, since that time, we've been facing discrimination and racism uh, ever since. You know, 80% uh, of the railroad on the western portion was built by Chinese. African American slaves uh, built the rest from the east coast. And on the day that they uh, put the golden spike in to commemorate uh, the completion, joining the two sides, uh, there was white workers, there was railroad officials, uh, but there's no Chinese and no African Americans in the picture. Wow. You know, soon after, um, there's a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment uh, especially in California, uh, that eventually led to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, you know, hoping to find a life, uh, a lot of the Chinese decided to go east uh, to the bigger cities, uh, to New York, to Boston, to Philly, uh, D.C., and, and Chicago. Uh, just because um, of discrimination, people clustered together in the seedier parts of downtown. Uh, because they had few employment opportunities, they opened laundromats and restaurants. And uh, those early restaurateurs uh, convinced uh, Americans that uh, shrimp fried rice and pork, uh, sweet and sour pork were authentic Chinese cuisine. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Chinatown's, Chicago's Chinatown first, uh, Chinatown was on Clark Street uh, near, near Van Buren and Harrison, right, right downtown. And about, uh, in 1912, uh, the whole community got pushed out because of, uh, of, of uh, racial discrimination, higher rents, gentrification, and they moved to where Chinatown is today, along Clark, uh, Clark and Wentworth. Uh, every other U.S. Chinatown is still in the original place downtown, and they're struggling with uh, gentrification. You know, the D.C. Chinatown uh, is no longer there because the uh, Capital One Sports Stadium is more important than having a Chinatown. Uh, as, as Chicago's Chinatown was displaced about 100 years ago, we face uh, less gentrification pressures, and we're the only urban Chinatown that's growing. We're about 35,000 uh, people now. But it's still part of the south side. Uh, you know, to the west of Chinatown is Pilsen, where, where Mexicans live. Uh, to the east is Brownsville, where we are today, where, where African Americans came during the Great Migration. Uh, to the south is Bridgeport, which was predominantly white until about 30 years ago, and now it's pretty much evenly divided between uh, Asians, Latinos, and whites. You know, tonight's conversation, uh, race, is not an easy conversation for Chinese, especially those in Chinatown. You know, every group is, uh, is ethnocentric, uh, and Chinese, uh, China is Zhonghua, which means Middle Kingdom. It's not talking about a time period, it's not talking about geography, it's basically saying that we're, we're the center of the universe. And, uh, and so even in the United States now, the, our community uh, tends to be uh, pretty insular. Uh, the new immigrants uh, who speak Chinese, I mean, there's good reason for that. Uh, but for many others, uh, we still keep to ourselves and our, our concern about our own affairs. You know, during the pandemic, um, Chinatown has dealt with a lot of structural discrimination. A lot of times it, it um, it takes the form of just of uh, language access. Uh, you know, Asian Americans were the highest, uh, experienced the highest unemployment uh, right after the pandemic. Um, and so with the vaccines, um, you know, Asian Americans are doing relatively good as a group uh, getting vaccinated, uh, but, but really with, with language and technology, it really is leaving out uh, Chinese immigrants in trying to get vaccines. You know, at the per March, 
and uh, recent rallies of anti-Asian hate, uh, some of the signs say, silent no more. You know, as, as a culture, our heritage is communal uh, rather than individualistic, and sometimes we're discouraged from speaking out. And uh, leaders often just uh, stand for the status quo. Uh, thankfully, things are changing. Uh, we're learning to speak out for ourselves, uh, but oftentimes we don't speak out enough uh, for those uh, who are facing injustice. In terms of Asian American hate, I'm thankful that we haven't had any incidents in Chicago, uh, like Oakland, in New York, in Atlanta, but our community is concerned about crime and vigilant about our seniors. And I've saved the hard issue uh, for last. You know, there's a tense uh, relationship between Chinatown and, and Asian Americans, or African Americans. Uh, too many of our, our residents and workers uh, racially profile African Americans and treat them with suspicion when they come into Chinatown. Uh, this past year, uh, we've, we've grieved over three murders and, and uh, a number of carjackings. Uh, some point to these crimes and trying to justify uh, their views. There aren't too many uh, prominent uh, Asian Americans, so we'll probably all end up uh, quoting Jeremy Lin tonight. Uh, you know, he said a lot about Asian American hate, but he also recently said this. It isn't true that the people you are hurting, uh, okay, it isn't true that the people you see hurting other people that look like you on the news represent an entire group of people. I better repeat that. It isn't true that the people you see hurting other people that look like you on the news represent an entire group of people. As a leader of a Chinatown coalition, we try to bring different sides together on a lot of community issues. On the race issue, Chinese culture offers few resources to combat racism. Uh, but as Christians, we have the Mago Day, and more important, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I'm so glad to be on this panel so that we could be learn, so I could uh, be learning each other's stories, uh, sharing our hearts, hurts and dreams, and learning to stand with and for each other to fight racism. Thank you. Well, I first want to say thank you to, to Pastor Ray. We certainly appreciate your leadership. It has just been a delight uh, to be a part of the work uh, that you're doing. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of us. We just really appreciate you. I want to take a few moments to, to lay out historically uh, and theologically uh, the, the unique thread that is tied uh, between the African American community and the Asian community. Currently, right now, all of us, we recognize COVID-19 as a pandemic. But one of the things that we also must recognize is that there is an epidemic that I call COVID-1619. COVID-1619 is the viral agent, or as one person said, the original sin of America. And that is rooted in this idea of white supremacy. And so from the moment that people of African descent landed upon these shores, they started out as a particular ethnic group that was enslaved, but because of something known as the Bacon Rebellion, where black people and those who were indentured servants got together and realized that the real enemy is the person in the big house. Something happened and something changed in the United States. The idea of the racialized imagination, or what Isabella Wilkerson calls the racial caste system in America. To say that one group is better than the other, and it was designed to be employed for specifically for white supremacy. Now, now during this period, you had black codes and slave codes. The slave codes uh, were specific uh, laws that were put in place to disenfranchise uh, Afri people of African descent because there was the fear of black power, especially in places like South Carolina, where you had a large number of people of African descent. And then you move into what you call the, the black codes, where state legislatures would come together because they feared that black people might vote. Hmm, sounds interesting. Uh, when state legislatures come together and they would then pass laws specifically so that there would be no black empowerment. But to see the connection between our communities is rather interesting. 
Because it was in 1850, there was a particular, uh, there was a legal action, People versus Hall. And it was in California, and People versus Hall essentially said that an Asian uh, person could not testify against somebody white. It became the blueprint for what we call the Dred Scott decision in 1857. The Dred Scott decision was simply this, that, uh, that no black person has any rights uh, that a white person is bound to protect, to, uh, is bound to respect. And, and so you have one particular case uh, that is laid out as a blueprint, and then it manifests it, its way in a particular way in reference to people of African descent. Now, this is, 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 is increased as a result of something known as the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act was that white people were given 160 acres of free land to go out west, and then the ideology of something known as manifest destiny, God wants you to go in that direction. And anyone you see who is indigenous or who is Asian does not belong because of this idea of caste and white supremacy, and God has already ordained you to move, uh, remove them, which then leads to one of the worst lynchings in American history that happens in 1871, where 17 Asian Americans are lynched solely because their bodies are weaponized. That lynching moment also gave the green light for continual lynchings of African Americans across the South. Our oppression is linked together, but our liberation is also connected together at the same time. So we have to see these two things connected together. Now, then you have the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. All right, that's again, weaponizing Asian Americans which then becomes the blueprint for Plessy versus Ferguson, which lays out the Jim Crow laws, that we are interlinked together. Now, with all of that history, with all of this viral agent of COVID-1619, still God was functioning and operating because in 1906, a group of Africans, Asians, and Latinos recognized that uh, the theology of white supremacy does not function in our spirits. And so you have the Azusa Street Revival, which is the coming together of multiple people who recognize that the spirit functions in a way that white supremacy cannot control. So you have people, African, Latino, and Asian. Now, many of them did not speak the same language, but the testimony is that when the spirit fell, we all understood each other. So you have in 1906, you have, have this revival that happens as a result. So anytime we talk about Pentecostalism, you're talking about literally a rainbow of colors coming together, knocking down white supremacy. So don't talk about Pentecostalism unless you're willing to include the diversity that God has already laid before us. Now, 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 with all of that that happens, you still have the forces of white supremacy pushing uh, against all of our communities in a variety of ways, especially if you lay out and look at Chicago. Chicago, what we call the Chicago machine, uh, was really set up under William uh, Thompson and a person by the name of Sir Mac. You go down the street all the time, but didn't know you were driving down a white supremacy street when you drove down there. So you have Sir Mac and Thompson, who recognized that there was a larger number of Africans coming from the South, Asians who were coming into this particular city, and in order to maintain power, they put together what we call the Chicago political machine because there were Germans and there were Irish and Italians who were fighting against each other, and they said, don't fight against each other. Let us exclude one particular group so that we can maintain power. Now, the individuals who were on the front line, who were busting heads during that time period, they didn't get any extra power. 
Uh, what they did, in the words of David Rodiger, they got the wage of whiteness. The wage of whiteness simply is this. The idea, I'm not, you know, not going to get any extra money, but I do get privilege, and I have, I'm in a different caste because I am now perceived as white, so-called white. I just want to put in the way that Jim Wallace says it this way, uh, that whiteness is solely something out of the imagination. Because if you leave America, they don't ask and say, welcome white person to England. They ask you, where are you from? And they want to know your particular ethnicity. But when you come back to the United States, you then get to be white once again. So you are white as long as there are people of color in the room. But as soon as people of color leave, you then begin to raise the question of what is your ethnicity? This is the way that white supremacy functions. And so we are tied together in, in our oppression, but we are also tied together in reference to our liberation. And one of those moments happened in the 1980s here in Chicago. Uh, there was a, a gentleman who decided to run for mayor by the name of Harold Washington. And because of a coalition of people of different communities, he becomes mayor. Now, he then inspires a minister by the name of Jesse Jackson to run for president who specifically makes entrees into communities that are Asian and Latino. As a result of that, he ends up inspiring uh, an entire group of people to register to vote. Eight million people end up on the rolls as a result of that, which then sets up uh, Clinton becoming president as a result but also puts in play the machine that ends up electing Barack Obama as president who comes out of Chicago because of that particular coalition. I'm here to let you know that white supremacy fears meetings like this. And the moment that we recognize that the inoculation for COVID-16-19 is not Moderna, is not Pfizer, is not any of these particular companies, but when we come together and recognize the spirit and power of God, we will tear down the walls that are keeping us from coming together as a community the way that God intends. Are you sure this isn't Sunday? <laughs> So we might have space for one response. So does anyone want to give like a minute, a quick minute respond, and then we're going to have someone uh, come up and, and share from, a, from the crowd, a, y a young person. And many times in our denominations, we, we, we have made Pentecostal something to divide people. But I was thinking about this this morning, that the miracle of Pentecost was that in Jerusalem, there were men and women from every part of the world, and they came together. And I thought about what you said and what you shared as well, that we need to stop making things denominational and understand even with COVID-16-19 and COVID-SARS-2 virus, I think that the most damning part of each of them is that they cause division. If we ever learn that, that we are not each other's enemy, if we understand our common humanity and we begin to act as the church is called to act, we'll find out we have more power than we've ever imagined. That's my comment. Amen. So we're going to have uh, a respondent after each of the sections. The first respondent is going to be Isaiah Jung. He's a PhD student at University of Illinois in Chicago in sociology. <laughs> He also happens to be a uh, graduate of Wheaton College and was a former student. And that we just uh, remarried, he got married last year during COVID and then got remarried to his existing wife this past weekend. So, what did you hear and what would you like to see done as a result? What I gather here as you know, a relatively young person is that the current historical events did not exist out of a vacuum, but there are historical reverberations that we're facing and feeling 
from centuries of white supremacy and economic injustices. So it's really important to know where we have come from as a country in order to address those ills. So thank you for the historical uh, context from this panel. And I find it deeply ironic that we're having this conversation a day after Resurrection Easter. I, find, I don't think it's a coincidence. And my hope as a Christian who is committed to justice is that the resurrected reality of Jesus Christ isn't just felt by individuals, but it will be felt throughout the whole cosmos, which includes the systems and institutions of white supremacy. And that this gathering between Asian Americans and African Americans doesn't become just an exception, but becomes a norm where the world is able to see what is going on in here, and we're able to proclaim the resurrected Jesus Christ allows us to gather here to get together and proclaim unity, and that we're able to lock arms together and look at white supremacy in the eyes and say no more. And that's my hope. <laughs>